In a recent video, I mentioned how if you add up the volume of every even dimensional sphere with radius 1, you get e to the pi. But here I want to quickly explain why that is the case, just because I found it pretty interesting. And to begin, we're going to look at the gamma function. This was also mentioned in the Euler number video, so I'm actually just going to replay that part. If you've seen it, go to this timestamp. For the rest of you, here's what you need to know. Here we can see the graph of x squared times e to the minus x. The area under it from 0 to infinity is exactly 2, which can also be written as 2 factorial. Now we'll graph x to the third times e to the minus x. The area under this from 0 to infinity is 6, aka 3 factorial. And here's x to the fourth times e to the minus x, whose area from 0 to infinity is 24, or 4 factorial. So as you can see, the exponent here, factorial, will equal the area under the curve from 0 to infinity. Another way to write this is the integral of this curve from 0 to infinity equals that exponent we see here, factorial. And this takes us to the gamma function, which is written a little differently, but says the same thing. And what this is is an extension of the factorial function. So if we wanted to find any integer factorial, we could just use this formula. The reason we need to start with the gamma function is because it shows up in the equation for the volume of an n-dimensional sphere. If you want a proof of where this comes from, I'll put a link below, but for this video we'll at least check that it holds for dimensions we're familiar with. So again, here's the equation for determining the volume of any sphere, which I'll keep up top. n represents the dimension we're in, r is the radius, and here on the denominator is the gamma function. So let's first check that this works for two dimensions, where the formula should output pi r squared, or the area of a circle. We plug in 2 for n and get pi to the 2 over 2, or pi to the first. r just has n as the exponent, which is 2 in this case, and that's all over gamma of 2 over 2 plus 1, which equals 2. Now I didn't explicitly mention this before, but note that the actual gamma function evaluated at some value refers to that number minus 1 factorial. So when we plug 2 into the gamma function, it comes out to 1 factorial, which is just 1. And thus we get pi r squared, just as expected. Now let's just try it for n equals 3 to see if we get 4 thirds pi r cubed, or the volume of an actual sphere. We plug in 3 for n, and we get pi to the 3 halves times r cubed all over gamma of 2.5. Now gamma of 2.5 would be the same as 1.5 factorial. In the last video, I showed how we could slide the exponent within the gamma function to calculate any number factorial. So I'll just do the same here with 2.5. We get roughly 1.329, which is the same as 3 fourths times the square root of pi. So we go back and put that value in the denominator, but since it can be written as 3 fourths times the square root of pi, everything will simplify to 4 thirds pi r cubed. Okay, now time to analyze all even dimensional spheres. I said before that these spheres all have a radius of 1, which means the r to the n term will always be 1 to the n, or just 1. Since that is the case, we can kind of ignore that r to the n term, which is why you won't see it in the upcoming calculations. So for dimension 0, or n equals 0, we get pi to the 0 over gamma of 1. For two dimensions, we get pi to the first over gamma of 2. For four dimensions, we get pi to the second over gamma of 3. And the integers you're seeing here will just keep going up by 1. So we can write the general term as pi to the k over gamma of k plus 1. Now notice that only integers are showing up within the gamma function, and as we saw, gamma of an integer is that value minus 1 factorial. So for zero dimensions, the denominator is really just 0 factorial, and for two dimensions, it's 1 factorial, for four dimensions, it's 2 factorial, and so on. The argument here is, again, that all of these values, or these volumes, add up to e to the pi. For anyone who knows what a Maclaurin series is, you should be able to see the explanation already. But for those who don't, I'm just going to replace all those pi's with x's and graph this function. Before I graph our infinite series, I'm going to put up the plot of e to the x, and you'll see why soon. Now, I cannot graph infinitely many terms, but I'll graph a good amount. The first term of x to the 0 over 0 factorial just comes out to 1, and the second term can be written just as x. So with only two terms, we have a line that is tangent to e to the x at x equals 0. Then after we graph the next term of x to the second over 2 factorial, the plot looks even closer to e to the x. Here we can see three terms, four terms, and I'll go up to 10 terms. Here you can see the series is definitely getting really close to e to the x. We really have to zoom in a lot just to see the differences. But as we go on forever, the series will approach a perfect approximation for e to the x. 
This means that infinite series we saw earlier can also be written as e to the x. And if we plug in pi for every x within the polynomial to infinity, we get the same output as we would plugging pi into e to the x. And this matches the original calculation we wanted to determine, which came from calculating all those even dimensional unit spheres. And we have finally come full circle to see why all those volumes sum to e to the pi. So hopefully that explains everything. Just wanted to make this quick follow up and we'll have a real video coming out soon. So if you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you all next time.